a device that's connected to the internet, you can look at uh, YouVersion and see all of the verses that we have on there. Otherwise, Scott has some uh, handouts. He has it in writing for you, all of the verses that we're going to look at. We've been looking at this, really, this, this one word. This is week five, and there's this one word that shows up about 70 times in the uh, scriptures. Almost all of them are in the book of Psalms, and it's this word, Selah, S-E-L-A-H, Selah. And Selah can have one of three different definitions, um, and we've been looking at the context of the scripture surrounding those definitions to to help give us an idea of what um, definition the, uh, the psalmist is talking about uh, in this. Now, every one of the words of Scripture are not only there on purpose, but their placement is there on purpose as well. And so that helps us understand why the sale is where it is. Now, I want to ask you a question today. And to be honest with you, it's a question that I think I already know the answer to. Um, I think that there would be universal agreement on the answer to this question, regardless of whether um, you live in the United States or in Europe or in Asia or in Africa, where, wherever you happen to be, um, where, whether you're uh, Catholic, Protestant, whatever stripe or flavor, if I were to ask you this question, I think that everybody would agree on the answer. Should we pray for our friends that are in need, or even pray for ourselves if we're in need. It's a kind of a no-brainer, right? I mean, I think even I've seen some people that, that claim not to be Christians, atheists will even say something like, I'm sending good thoughts your way, or I'm giving you my best wishes. Uh, that would be the atheist way of saying that they're praying, right? But there, there really is that universal, I mean, I, I, I don't think that you would find somebody that if you said to them, hey, I've got a friend over here that's in need, uh, should we pray for them, or if you'd like, should we send good thoughts their way? There's going to be very few people that are going to go, no, don't pray for them. In fact, send bad thoughts their way, right? It's, it's kind of universal. That, that, are, you, are you in agreement with me? With everybody, I think it's probably 100% here. We should pray for our friends that are in need. Now, I want to ask you a follow-up question that I think might not be as universal in the answer. I think that we might have some a lot of different answers when if we agree that we should pray for our friends that are in need, here's my second question that might be a little bit more challenging. How long should we pray for them? How long should we be in prayer for our friends in need? Is it, is it good enough if we just, if we tell them we're going to pray for them and we pray for them once? I mean, because God knows, right? And so he heard us the very first time we prayed. And so there should be, you know, God's got it. So do we have to keep on praying? Do we, do we pray for the next day, the next week, next month, next year, the next decade? How, how long do we pray? Now, now let, me, let, me, let me qualify that a little bit. Let's, let's look at one specific example, okay? Let's say that we're praying for uh, a friend to get a job. Or we're praying for a friend that is sick and needs a healing touch in their body. Or we're praying for a marriage that is struggling and needs restoration. If we're praying for those things and our friend gets the job, has healing in their body, or their marriage is restored, do we stop praying then? Is that, that the, I mean, that's what we're praying for. We're saying, God, I pray that you would give my friend a job and... They call you or they text you and they say, hey, I got the job. And you say, praise God. So are we done? You're praying for somebody whose marriage is really just hanging by a thread. And you pray for that. And they say, hey, you know what? We've been talking. We got, uh, we've been in touch with the counselor. We've, we've been able to resolve some things. And our marriage is going great now. Thanks for praying for us. Really appreciate it. Do we, are we done praying? How long do the, do the prayers keep going? Now, the reason why I think it's important for us to explore that is because these psalms that, that we're going to look at today, and I say psalms plural, because initially when I first started uh, outlining this series, I put Psalm 20 all, as a sermon, as a message all by itself. But as I began studying this week, I noticed something 
that Psalm 20 and Psalm 21 are really companion psalms. They link together pretty good. Now, let me, let me show you the reason why uh, we say that. Now, first of all, there, there's this introductory remark there for the director of music, a psalm of David. You'll notice that that's exactly the same for Psalm 20 and Psalm 21. Now, that by itself, it, it, it limits it because of all of the psalms that have some kind of a notation at the beginning. Um, there's only about a dozen or so that uh, actually have this exact uh, wording in this exact order. But if you'll notice, you can look back at Psalm 19, it has the same one. So that doesn't necessarily mean that they're linked together, but at least kind of raises the possibility that they could be companion pieces. But the other thing that I notice as well is that these psalms that go together or seem to go together because Psalm 20, if you'll notice, it starts off right at the beginning. There's a lot of the word may there. There's prayer requests that are taking place. Asking God, would you do this? Would you do this? Would you do this? And in Psalm chapter 21, the tone throughout and the wording throughout that whole psalm is, you have done it. And it appears that it is thanks for prayers that have been prayed. And, and even some of the things that were prayed for in Psalm 20 are specifically recognized in Psalm 21 as thank you, God, for answering this. So that, that also kind of piques my interest that makes me think that maybe these two psalms are companions psalms. But there's one other thing, too, that really stands out to me, and that is this little word that we've been looking at, Selah. If you'll notice that in both of these psalms, the, the Selah appears in roughly the same place in both psalms. And you'll also notice, if you took the time to like flip through and look at all the places where Selah was uh, in, the, uh, in the psalms, um, a lot of, we've seen some, psalms at, some Selahs at the end of psalms, and we've seen some others in the middle uh, as well. But if, if you look, these are really kind of, both Selahs are in the middle of a thought, it's almost like David's interrupting his thought that's there. And look at the wording, how similar the wording is around both Selahs. In Psalm chapter 20, it's, May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings, Selah. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. Now look at Psalm 21. You have granted him the desires of his heart and not withheld the request of his lips. Selah. And then it starts going through in the next verses. Uh, he asked and you gave. Uh, verse number five, you gave. Verse, uh, verse five as well, you bestowed. Verse six, you granted. So there's this, in both Psalms, there's this idea of desires being expressed to God. And there's a prayer feel in Psalm 20 and then an answer feel to Psalm 21. They, these, these two Psalms appear to be linked together, companion pieces. And so in this first psalm, uh, Psalm chapter 20, I want us to look at this word Selah that's here. And this is one of our definitions to pause and calmly think about this. Pause and calmly think about this. Now, if you'll, if you'll look, like I said, there's a lot of may uh, requests there. And there's six or seven of them, depending on the translation that you have. Um, so it starts off by, by saying, May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. Selah. May he give you the desire of your heart to make all your plans succeed. Now, this is where some translations put the next may in there. It would say, May we shout for joy when you are victor victorious and we will lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Now, remember that, that Selah uh, is, a, is a musical notation. And so for those of you that have, have played in a band or, or you've uh, sung in a choir or you've, you've watched one of those things where there's a director up front, 
you know, you'll see a director like this and with one hand he's, he's keeping the tempo and with his other hand he'll be pointing to different people saying, you know, I need a little bit more from you. Okay, soften this part. You know, you'll see these little things that he's doing. When, when we say Selah, what we're really saying is that the director of the music, the, the conductor that's up there, has stopped with his hands. There's this pause. Isn't it really weird where David would put this pause? Now, the, the word Selah is chosen on purpose, but the location is chosen on purpose as well. So here's David in the midst of giving these prayer requests. He says, God, would you hear us? Would you answer us? Would you move on our behalf? Would you come and grant the desires of our hearts? And then he feels this pause, this Selah. And this is why I think this is pause and calmly think about this. Da David is writing down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speak into his heart, speak into his mind, and he's writing this down. These prayer requests, may you do this, may you do this. And then you see, just like the conductor stopped with his baton, David stops with his pen. So we got to pause right there. My goodness. Do you realize what it is that we're doing right here? Do you realize what we are in the midst of have we forgotten what exactly is going on when we start a prayer and we say, God, may you do this, may you do this, may you do this. And David gives four of them, and then he pauses, and then he gives more. He goes right back into his prayer requests after that. Why would he pause right in the middle of his prayer requests? Why would he tell us, hold on, stop, pause right here. I need you to think about something. There's three things that I think that, that he is asking us to consider here. And the first one is this. I'll, he's saying, I want you to contemplate this, that God invites us to participate in the fulfilling of his plans by our prayers. Now think about that for a second. Let's not rush past that. We are talking about the all-knowing, all-powerful, all present creator and sustainer of the universe. Now, do we honestly think that when we say to him, God, would you help my friend? They need a job. Do you think that God doesn't know that they don't need a job? Do you think he goes, oh, thanks for letting me know. I wasn't aware of that. God already has his plans for the universe he had them in mind and had them already established before he even said, let there be light and started this universe. There is nothing that can thwart his plans. And yet in prayer, he actually, the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present creator, sustainer of the universe, asks us, invites us to participate with him in the fulfilling of his plans. He doesn't need us, but he desires us to be involved with him. He invites us. He says, throughout his word, he says, pray to me. Ask me, and I'll give you that. Ask me, and I'll explain the things you don't understand. Ask me, and I will supply. He invites us to participate, and I think that's one of the things when David is saying, may you provide this, may you do this, may you grant this, may... I'm not telling God something he doesn't already know, and he's inviting me to be involved with this. But here's the other thing that I think that we should stand in awe of, is that God loves to hear from us. We're not a nuisance to him. He doesn't go, come on, I got, I got some things to do. Pick it up here. I mean, if you've ever read any, like, Greek or Roman mythology, or if you've seen any of the movies or TV shows based on that, you know one of the things you'll see about those Greek and Roman gods with a small g? They get annoyed. They have squabbles among themselves. They have squabbles with the, the lowly mortals. The mortals sometimes are fighting against them. Sometimes they say, you know what? I'm tired of that guy. I don't even want to pay attention to him anymore. And a lot of times when news comes to him and says, hey, did you know that the people over here are doing an uprising against you? They go, what? How dare they? And they, they're unaware. They're clueless. And they get annoyed that these lowly little mortals are coming to them. 
We see nothing of the sort in Scripture. We see a God who John simply described as love. God is love. He doesn't have love. He doesn't have the capacity to love. He is love. He embodies love. And so he loves to hear from you. In fact, one of the reasons why he made you is so that he could hear from you. One of the, the reasons why Jesus came and died on the cross is to fulfill all of these pictures that we see throughout the scripture of God being a father that wants to wrap his children up or God as a bridegroom that wants to rescue his bride. And that's why Paul talks about us being a glorious bride. And that's why Paul talks about us being able to come into God's presence and calling him daddy. God loves for us to spend time with him. He loves for us to be in his presence. You are never an imposition to him. You are never coming on a bad day for him. And so again, David is writing this, God, may you do this, may you do this. And then he pauses, Selah, wow, the almighty creator of the universe wants me to do this and he loves for me to come into his presence. But the third thing that we have to remember as well is that God is powerful enough to answer what it is that we ask. Amen. He doesn't, when we come to him and say, God, I need this, he doesn't go, ah, you know, it's uh, the end of the month, I'm a little short right now, could you come back next week? There's never, like, uh, uh, I suppose I could divert some things over here and try to give you a little bit over here. I mean, that's the mentality that we have, right? Because we think about our own household budgets, or we think about our government saying, well, we're going to have to cut this to put money over here. We, we think about businesses doing that kind of stuff all the time, having limited resources. But God is all-powerful. He doesn't have any lack whatsoever. So we don't go to him going, oh, I wish, I wish, I hope, I hope, I hope. In fact, now, I, I'm not, I don't know that I'm done with this yet. Um, I was sharing with Betsy this week. God's been working with me on this definition for a while. You know, I think sometimes we have this idea of hope, like kind of cross your fingers. I hope this works out. And, and what God's been, been, this definition is not done yet. You're getting kind of a, an advanced copy. I'm not totally done with this yet. But I think what hope is, as the Bible describes it, is this unwavering confidence in the promises of God. Knowing that God said this, and I, I, I'm confident that he said that. Not, I hope, but I'm confident, and my confidence doesn't waver in the promises of God. And so here's what David, when we get to this spot, David says, I want you to sail it right here. I mean, he, he gives us these... Four mays, may the Lord answer you. May the name of God protect you. May he send you help. May he remember all your sacrifices. Hold on a second here. Pause for a minute and think about this. That the all-powerful creator of the universe that doesn't need our help is inviting us to be involved with him. He loves when we're involved with him and he's powerful enough to give us the answer. And then he goes on and says, you know, I'm going to continue to ask these questions. May he give you the desire of your heart. And make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy when you're victorious. May the Lord grant all your requests. And then he goes on in this Psalm 20 to say, Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He answers him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. Now here it sounds to me like David is probably praying for um, victory in battle. Based on not only what he says here, but what also we're going to see as an answer in Psalm 21. Some trust in chariots, and some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. O oh Lord, save the king, answer us when we call. And so here's David saying, let's pause and think about this. In the middle of our asking our prayer, let's, let's think about this. The all-powerful creator, sustainer of the universe. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't need your intel to tell him what's going on. He doesn't need you to say, hey, come over here. Maybe you haven't seen this. He knows it all, sees it all, but he still says, I want you to participate. I love when you participate with me because we grow closer together in the process and then you get to stand and see my power unleashed. You get to see how I'm going to move in this behalf of this request. Now, I asked you earlier the question, when 
do we stop praying? So here's, here's David saying, I prayed, and now I know that the Lord saves. I, I know, I know that, he, that he answers, that he saves. And then we go to verse number 21, or chapter 21. O Lord, the king rejoices in your strength. How great is his joy in the victories you give. Now, he was probably just praying for victory in battle in chapter 20. So how you, you've given the victory. And then, again, the words that are very similar in, in verse number um, 4 of chapter 20, we're saying, may the Lord give you the desire of your heart to make all your plans succeed. And now in chapter 21, verse 2, he says, you have granted him the desire of his heart and not withheld the request of his lips. And then there's this other Selah that's there. See, when, when we're praying for a friend that needs a job and they call us and tell us that they have a job, do we stop praying then? When we're praying for a friend that needs healing and she receives a healing touch and she calls and says, hey, the doctor says I got a clean bill of health, do we stop praying then? When, when the marriage needs restoration or somebody needs a financial miracle and the marriage is strong or the finances come through, do we stop praying then? Now you might say, oh, okay, I see where you're going. Because Psalm 20 is a prayer of petition. And so it looks like Psalm 21 is a prayer of praise. So that's, that's, so the answer is no, we don't stop praying. We get the answer, right? We pray one more time and say, here's my prayer of praise, my prayer of thanks and gratitude that God, you answered, you gave the job, you restored the marriage, you brought the healing, you provided the finances, whatever it was that we were praying for. So thank you for doing that. We're done. I think we sell ourselves way too short. I think that we stop way too short when we stop praying, even if we have the prayer of praise. I think we stop too short. I want to show you a couple things from the New Testament. Jesus said this, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more you've got a pen or your Circle that. How much more will your Father in Heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? Now, as parents, um, unless our kids have been taken away from us or we've been thrown into prison for child neglect, we're probably providing food and shelter and clothing for our kids. And probably some other things on top of that as well. And Jesus said, by comparison, you're evil. That's the best you got. How much more is God going to give good gifts to those who ask him? So Paul, uh, Paul builds on this in Ephesians. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. You see those things right in there that God is inviting us to participate. He loves for us to participate. He's got the power when we do pray to him to, to work. But he wants to do more than what? Than we can ask or imagine. I want you to see this out of a, the Amplified Version. He is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly, far over and above all that we dare ask or think. You know, you, the, the verse before there, you're like, well, it's more than we ask or think. Now it's going a little bit farther, more than you even dare to ask or think about. Like, ooh, man, can I ask that? He wants to do super abundantly far over and above all that we dare ask or think. But one more, look at this one, uh, same verse out of the Living Bible. He is able to do far more than we would ever dare to ask or even dream of infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes. And so again, David has this Selah in this unusual place. Just like in Psalm chapter 20, he's in the middle of his prayer request, and then he goes, wait, hold on. Pause for a second and think about this. What, what am I doing? As a, I, I, I am actually talking to the creator of the universe. He doesn't need my help, but he wants me to be here participating with him. He loves to hear from me. He's got the power to answer and and wow, this is amazing. And then he goes, okay, let me go on with my prayer request. It's the same thing in chapter 21. He starts giving his praise, 
Thank you for doing this. You have granted the desires of my heart. You've provided all these things. And then he pauses again. He, he says, oh, wait a minute. What am I doing here in this praise? What's, what's, what's going on here? I think that this is our definition for Selah, where the pause is so that we can kind of take a breath and come out of it with greater enthusiasm, with greater strength, where there's an accentuation as we come out of this. Because here's what happens, friends. When we pray for a friend that is in need, and they get the job, and we say, thank you, God, for giving my friend this job, this is where we often stop. But God wants to do immeasurably, abundantly, super abundantly more. What if what we thought was the end, was the goal, for God was just the door or the beginning to what he wanted to do? See, what we had in mind was, here's our friend that needs a job because they need to provide for their family. But God says, I'm going to provide for their family and I'm going to do super abundantly more than that because I've placed them in a mission field. I put them someplace where they need to share the gospel with somebody else or where they're going to learn a skill that they need down the road or they're going to cross paths with somebody's life that they wouldn't have crossed paths with them any other way than being at that job site. What if the reason why God restored that marriage was not just to say that marriage is solid and whole and strong and healthy, but so that that couple could do far more for the kingdom of God in that strengthened state than they could when they were struggling before. See, we pray too short-sighted. We think that's the end. We think the answer is just the job or the healing or the restoration. But in God's eyes, he wants to do infinitely, abundantly, super abundantly more than that. That's just the beginning of what he wants to do. So look in this psalm. Now, we already said there that in Psalm 20, David is probably praying for victory in a battle. Okay? But... God gives him more than just the victory in battle. Look at verse number four. David even puts it side by side. He asked you for life, and you gave it to him. Well, what kind of life did he give? He gave eternal life. Ooh, David was praying, let me live through this battle. And God said, I got super abundance more than that. I want you to live through the battle so that that's just the beginning. I want to give you eternal life so that you can do great things for me. And in David's case, we know that from David's line, his family line, comes Jesus, the David that is going to set everything right at the end, the one that's going to reign eternally on the throne forever and ever. And that's why he said, you asked just for life, but what I want to give you is eternal life. Look in verse number um, five, uh, or I'm sorry, verse number six. He said, you know, you were asking for blessings back there in chapter 20, but look, look what he granted them. Eternal blessings made him glad with the joy of your presence, which never ends, right? For the king trusts in the Lord through the unfailing love of the Most High. He said, you were just asking for a blessing right there, and it stopped, and I wanted to give you eternal blessings I wanted to give you my presence, and I wanted to give you my love that just keeps on going and going and going. And that's why I think that it's we are far too short-sighted when we just say, oh, thank you. You gave him the job. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus, for providing that job. And we stop. That's not where God wanted to stop. Sure, the praise is great, but he wants to keep going. So notice in, in verse number five, the first verse there, through the victories you gave. His glory is great. It's through the answer to the prayer. It's through the job that he provided. It's through the restored marriage. It's through the healed body. It's through the financial provision or whatever it is. When that isn't the end. That's the beginning of what he wants to do. So when you're praying for a friend and they get the job, don't stop praying. Say, now God, you placed them there on purpose. This was all a part of fulfilling your plan. This wasn't just to give a job. This was to give a ministry. This was to give opportunity. This was to give, as David says here, not just life, but eternal life. Not just one blessing, but eternal blessings. Not just an experience of God's presence, 
but staying in God's presence and experiencing his unfailing love over and over and over again. That's what he wants to do. So if we would make this a part of our prayer life, that when we are in the midst of our petitions, when we're praying, may you do this, may you do this, if we would sail up somewhere in there, maybe we need to sail up before we even start. Maybe once you start asking the request, and maybe that's David's case, he, he, start, he just came right in, God, I got a lot of things that are really heavy on my heart, so I just, may you do this, and would you help out this, and would you, hey, what am I doing? Who am I speaking to? God's inviting me to do this with him? If we would just pause in those, in those prayers when we have those needs, I think that we would pray a little bit more frequently than we do. As Philippians reminds us, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Anytime that you have that moment of anxiety, that pang, and you begin to pray... I'm going to turn that anxious thought into a prayer, but wait a minute, let me sail it just for a second and think about it here. What am I actually doing when I'm praying? And then in Psalm 21, this sailor here, when, when the answer comes and we say, thank you, God, for this victory, wait a minute, this victory, you want to do something through this. That wasn't just the end. You want to go far beyond that. First Thessalonians, this is my paraphrase of First Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Always joyful, always praying, always thankful. God loves this. This is how he loves for always joyful, always praying, always thankful. I love the fact that the praying is sandwiched between the joyful, the joyfulness and the thankfulness. You can be joyful, but don't just stop and say thanks for the job. Keep on going and saying thanks for the door that you've opened. Well, I'm joyful for the healing, but I'm thankful that that's the beginning of something else. I'm joyful that you restored this marriage, but I'm thankful that there's going to be something else. That it's because he wants to do super abundantly beyond what we can even imagine or dare to dream or think. It's not just about a job. It's not just about an answered prayer. It's about the open door to all that God wants to do beyond that. And so we need to sail it when we're praying, and we need to sail it when we're praising in the answer to the prayer. Pause at both of those times and realize what it is that we're participating in, and then realize that what God has provided, that's not the end of what he's provided. He didn't just give the job. He gave so much more, super abundantly more. So I wrote this down in my notes to kind of sum it up this way. Don't quit praying when times are tough. Don't quit praying when you've prayed a long time. Don't quit praying when it seems like God has answered. Keep on praying always about everything. Always about everything. That means keep on praying even when you say, hey, it appears that you already answered, but I'm going to keep on praying because there's something else that you want to do here. There's something far greater. I can't even see it yet. And sometimes you might not see it until you get to heaven and you see, oh, that's why God placed you there. That's why he allowed that to happen, because that opened up this thing that I never would have dared to imagine, never would have dreamed that that was. But God, the all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful creator, he saw that and he invited you to participate in not only the prayer for petition, but the prayer of praise that keeps on going after it appears that it's been answered so that God continues to work his plans and he gets the glory. Now, is God going to do that even if you don't pray? Yeah. But how are you going to be able to give him glory for it? Because you're not going to see it. Prayer opens our eyes to see what God is doing. And so that we can go, oh, look, there's another God thing. There's another God thing. Hey, and you can remind your friend, too, that you pray for. Hey, you know, remember we were praying for your healing? And God did heal, but look what he's done since then. Hey, remember we were praying for God to give you that job? And he did. But look at you never would have had this. You never would have crossed paths here. You never would have learned this experience if God hadn't given this one. So let's keep praying because there's other things that he's going to do super abundantly beyond all that we can imagine or even dare to think of. Sail when you pray. Sail when you praise. And then keep on, keep on, keep on praying. Let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you. It, it, it is truly mind-boggling to our, our human brains that the creator of the universe would invite us 
to participate with you. But you do. And so, God, we don't want to turn down your invitation. We don't want to make excuses. We don't want to delay. We want to quickly respond. And we want to participate. And so, God, may we be quick to come to you. Anything that makes us anxious, anything that makes us upset, anything that starts to baffle us or confuse us, may we quickly turn that to a prayer. And whether it's before we start saying, may you do this and may you do this, and we bring our petitions, or if it's in the middle, as your Holy Spirit reminds us, may we, Selah, may we pause to just recall yes. how awesome it is what you've invited us to do in participating in prayer with you. And then God, when those answers come, when you have provided the things that we've been praying for, may we be quick to praise you for that and thank you for what you've done. But may we also not stop our prayers because we know that there's something so much greater that you want to do. Help us in our busy world and in all the things that compete for our attention. Help us to be able to build these Sela times into our petitions and into our praise. And may we be people that keep on praying, keep on being joyful, keep on being thankful, keep on petitioning you because we know that you're doing super abundantly over and beyond, above our wildest hopes and dreams, far beyond what we could even imagine. How great you are and how loving you are. Thank you for letting us participate with you in that. I pray for some of my friends this week that I know that they're facing challenges. They've been praying for a need in their life. I pray, God, that this would be the week that they see the breakthrough. I pray for some of my friends that they've been praying for someone else for a long time, and maybe they've started to become weary. Maybe they've begun to think, well, I don't know that anything is going to change here. God, would you renew their passion and their perseverance in prayer this week that they can experience as well that, that joy of remaining in your presence, seeing how you're going to move, and knowing that you're going to do super abundantly above and beyond all that we ask or think. Bless my friends this week, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.